itself. There's lots of good things in there uh, about Cynthia. Um, I first uh, um, was in touch with her in November of 2012 when she uh, contacted me about reviewing. Uh, she was co-editing a special issue on machine learning for science and society. And uh, she asked me if I would review for that. Uh, now I said no, uh, but that didn't make our relationship uh, suddenly very cold uh, because we instantly got into a chat about uh, using uh, very simple rules uh, to, uh, to do classification. And uh, that is of course something that I had worked on a long time ago and uh, she was getting into it. I looked through her DBLP publication record and it seems that up to that point, up till 2012, she'd actually been working on other things but uh, there was almost a turn in her, in her research career in 2012 where she got very interested in machine learning for science and society and interpretable rules uh, and things like that. And she's been working on that as far as I can tell ever since. Uh, I, I haven't worked on it myself, but every now and then when I feel like, you know, something to lift me up, I go to her DBLP page to see what she's published lately. And I just pull out a random paper and read it. And it's always a great piece of work. Uh, so um, anyway, with no further ado, I will turn it over to Cynthia. I know she's got a really exciting talk for us today. Thanks, Rob. I um I should I should reveal the secret of what actually that turn of events was. So before 2012, um, I had been working on power grid reliability with the power company in New York. I was trying to predict which manholes in New York would explode. And uh, I'm I'm completely serious about this. I spent my three years of my life doing this. This is uh, power grid reliability. And at that point, I realized that machine learning actually didn't work. <laughs> like all the methods were performing the same and the data was so dirty. And it was very, it was a very, very difficult uh, project. And so I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm designing machine learning algorithms that I can understand so that I can troubleshoot them better and do a better job on problems that actually matter to society like power grid reliability. And so that's where that seeming turn of events um, came from. Okay, so let me share my screen here. Um, can you see it? Yeah. Yep. Is it coming up? Yes, we can see that. Okay, great. So yeah, um, so I work in interpretable machine learning and over the years I've seen the field of machine learning lean more and more toward complicated models, even in cases where they're completely unnecessary. And I didn't just want to give a talk that says stop using black box models because that isn't really constructive. That's more just destructive. And so I wanted to tell you not just don't use black box models, but I wanted to tell you why you don't need them. So I want to give you an example of recidivism prediction in the criminal justice system. Now they use predictive models to determine people's risk of being arrested in order to determine whether to release someone on bail or for social services. And in some cases, these models are so complicated that it's easy to compute the predictions incorrectly. And uh, this is a New York Times article about a case where a typographical error uh, in the input to a predict complicated predictive model led to years of extra prison time for someone. And the typo was in his criminal history features. And the model that the criminal justice system was using for his prediction was called COMPASS. And you, you know, you'd think that these black box models like Compass would be really accurate given that they potentially use over hundred features and that they're sort of widely used in the criminal justice system, but they aren't. So we did an experiment with some data from Florida to try to test the accuracy of this particular black box model um, Compass that as I mentioned, it's used very widely across the US criminal justice system. Okay, so. In this experiment, we compared the accuracy of scores from the black box model with scores created by our latest machine learning method at the time of this experiment. And the method is called corals or certifiably optimal rule lists. <laughs> These are very sparse one-sided decision trees, um, one, you know, just decision lists like if then rules. And um, it produced, you know, it produces certifiably optimal sparse decision trees. Now I'm gonna show you the optimal sparse decision tree for for this Florida data set for predicting arrest. Okay, so the, it's, a, it's a really small machine learning model. It fits in the corner of a PowerPoint slide and it says, if you're really young and you're male, predict arrest within two years of your compass score calculation. Else, if you're a little bit older and you have some prior offenses, predict arrest. Else, if you have more than three priors, predict arrest, else predict no arrest. 
And we looked at this model and we thought, okay, that's pretty simple. There's no way that it's gonna be as accurate as Compass. So, but how accurate, how accurate is it? Um, and the answer was they were very comparable. Um, so this is tenfold cross-validation and the different colors are different folds of the data and we're getting very, very comparable um, accuracy results. And the interesting thing is that not only do these two models perform the same, as it turns out, no matter which method we try, uh, all the methods tend to perform the same. And some of these are black boxes, very complicated black boxes, like, you know, this is um, boosted decision trees, uh, random forest, support vector machine, radial basis function kernels. Like you can't put these models on a PowerPoint slide. Whereas the models from corals is actually just this one right here in the corner. And it gets that model, essentially that same model on all 10 folds. Okay, so um, great. So now there was a huge debate about algorithmic fairness of Compass, but the truth is that we just don't need, seem to need Compass at all, right? We're still using it. <laughs> anyway, so back to my point here, um, you know, perhaps we are using complicated models when we don't need them. And there, the, there doesn't seem to be, um, you know, any benefit from complicated models, at least for recidivism prediction and criminal justice. And I've listed uh, some papers that really go into more, more depth on that. Um, but it also seems to be true that there's no benefit from complicated models from lots of problems. And I've listed a whole bunch of problems here, all of which I've worked on, including the power grid project <laughs> um, that I've listed right here. And for any, all of these data sets that I've worked on, I didn't find a benefit from super complicated models. Okay, so, but it really depends on your, your data set, right? So neural networks are really great for computer vision, right? Where, where you need to create a good representation of the data. But if your data naturally come with a good representation, like if the data are tabular and you understand what all the features are, um, like in these problems over here that I've listed, um, then the accuracy of all algorithms tends to be very similar to each other. Um, with a little fiddling, you know, you still have to fiddle around with the data and make the features nice and so on and tune the parameters of the algorithms, but they do end up performing very similarly to each other. Okay, so um, then why are people then still using complicated models? And the answer is because they like them. They're profitable. Um, it's much easier to make, a, make money off of a super complicated model than it is a very simple one like the model that I showed you on the previous slide from Corals. Uh, but also they're much easier to construct than, than simpler models. It's kind of ironic that complicated models are easier to construct and that simple models can be very, very hard to find. So let's say that we're doing supervised learning, plain old supervised learning, where you want to minimize a loss to make your model accurate. But now if you also want it to be simple, you have to constrain the optimization problem. And uh, that to, to force the complexity of the model to be small. And then once you get to constrained optimization and depending on the constraints, the problem becomes much harder. So for instance, if, you, if you're doing decision tree learning and you want to get a low loss, you could just use cart or something like that, which produces some big tree and it would give you a low loss. But if you wanna get that same loss or better with a sparser model, then that's exponentially more work to get to it, right? Some of these problems are NP hard. And as a preview of what's coming later, the algorithm that um, created this very sparse yet accurate uh, tree on this, um, on this data set is something that we're working on right now. Um, I've been working on optimal decision trees for many years. And so I'm gonna tell you later about the algorithm that produced this tree that's more optimal in the sense of the balance between accuracy and sparsity than, um, than the one that CART produced. Okay, so if the problem on the left is about producing accurate decision trees, well, that's much easier than finding an accurate and sparse decision tree Right, or sparse decision tree with the same accuracy, right? It's, this is exponentially harder. If the problem on the left is to find an accurate linear model, that's much harder than finding, um, you know, you, there you can do it, you can just use regression or logistic regression. But um, once you add sparsity constraints, then the problem becomes much harder. Uh, so what, what about if you just unleash the most complexity that you have on the problem? Like you just launched a neural network or boosted decision tree at the problem. Well, um, can, the question is, can you get the same accuracy with an accurate and sparse decision tree or an accurate and sparse linear model? 
And that's the kind of question that I want to answer. Okay, so when I'm doing these things in practice, um, I want to know, like, am I going to get the, am I going to get the same, you know, accuracy by solving the constrained problem as I am for the unconstrained problem? I want to know if I need to sacrifice accuracy to gain interpretability. Okay, so in other words, I want to determine whether this equality ho approximately holds in practice without actually solving the constrained problem, because the constrained problem is much harder to solve, right? So I want to know whether these things are going to be equal to each other without actually solving this one. Okay, so um, yeah, so in other words, can we determine the existence of a simple yet accurate model without actually finding one? All right, so in this talk, I'm going to define a condition under which a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist. And that condition is that what's called the Rashomon set is large. And then I'm going to define computationally efficient solutions to some of these hard optimization problems. And in particular, I want to talk about decision trees. And I've listed my wonderful collaborators uh, here. OK, so let's talk about this condition under which a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist. All right, so as I mentioned, it's that the Rashomon set is large. So let me define for you what the Rashomon set is. Um, the true Rashomon set, it's the set of models with low true loss. OK, so I want you to think about abstract function space along this axis. And then this is the expected loss over the whole distribution of data. Um, I assume that the distribution that the data are drawn IID from an unknown distribution over X cross Y. OK, so the Rashomon set is the set of models that have low true loss. OK, so models that have loss um, functions such that the expected loss is below some value theta. All right, so it's the set of models that perform well with the full distribution from which the data are drawn, IID. OK, and I claim that if the um, true Rashomon set is large, then a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist. It's kind of like, like this big, like a big ocean theory, right? The bigger the ocean is, the higher the chances that you'll find a big fish in there somewhere, right? Uh, and, and the larger the Rashomon set is, the larger the chance that you could find a simple function in there somewhere, right? There's just so many good models that hopefully at least one of them is simple. Okay, so I'm gonna change my notation just a little bit so that the expected loss is just called L here. So this is just expected loss over the data. And by the way, I've drawn a super nice smooth function there, but I could easily have chosen a weird looking lost surface to that's that's totally okay. All right, and the Rashomon set here is disjoint and that's totally fine. Okay, so now I want to show you the simplest possible abstract setting um, to show you how this thing on the bottom could, could actually happen. So it's like the simplest possible abstract setting that we could think of where, where you could see this phenomenon. Okay, so let's say that we have two hypothesis spaces. Um, um, they're both finite. So it's a finite number of functions in each set. So you have simple, simple models, F1, what I call simple models, just a set of functions. And then F2 is the set of all models. And I'm assuming here that the set of simple models is within the set of all models. And then I'm assuming F1 is un uniformly drawn from F2 without replacement. So I know that that is not, I know that that's abstract. And I know that simple models aren't randomly drawn from a more complex model class. But in reality, as long as each complex model is reasonably close to a simple model, the same idea that I'm going to show you is going to work. OK, now um, F2 star, this is the best possible model if you know everything. Like you know the whole distribution of data. You have all models in your universe available to you. So that's this is the best model if you know everything, whereas F1 hat, on the other hand, that's the best possible model that you could produce. You only have access to the training set, the training data, and um, you are only, you're restricting yourself to work with simple functions. So that's, um, so F2 star, F1 hat. We're gonna compare the results from these two things. Like we wanna know whether F1 hat is gonna perform as well as F2 star. 
And I'm gonna simplify my notation just a little bit again. So expected loss is gonna be written just as L and then empirical, uh, the empirical loss, uh, average empirical loss is gonna be written as L hat. Okay, so what I want is that the best true risk of the complex class, so in other words, L of F2 star, this stuff, is I want it to be close to the best empirical risk I could get from the simpler class. Okay, so that's what I can get based on my own calculations with my own finite data set with my own simple function class. All right, so in other words, I want L of F2 star, the best thing I could do if I knew everything, to be close to what I can do on my data in practice. Okay, great. So I'm just gonna, um, and, and it's going to, by the way, it's going to define, it's going to depend, it's going to depend, this upper bound is going to depend on the what's called the Rashomon ratio. And the Rashomon ratio is the fraction of models that are good. It's the fraction of models in F2 such that they have low true loss, okay? So this is the Rashomon set up here. So it's the fraction of all good, it's the fraction of all models that are in the Rashomon set. Okay, good. So another way to say it is just, it's the fraction of models that are good. All right, so I put all that notation up here in case you weren't paying attention, which is super, super easy to do with, um, with Zoom. So all that notation is just up here. And uh, here's the theorem. Okay, so the theorem says that um, with high probability, okay, so with high probability, and I haven't told you what this P is yet, I will, okay? With high probability, with respect to the random draw of the, of the functions from F2 to form F1, and with respect to the random draw of the data, okay? So with respect to all the randomness with high probability, these two quantities that I wanted to be close together are upper bounded by this, this thing over here, which depends interestingly on the complexity of the smaller class of functions. So again, this is the best thing you can do if you know everything. This is what you can do on your training set with your simpler class of models. And if these two things are close, that means that simple models do as well as it's simple models when viewed with, from data do as well as these, these the, the more complicated models class on all of the, the whole population. And I want these things to be close. And in fact, the upper bound um, on their difference depends on the size of F1. Now, the interesting bit here is this P, the probability with which this holds, and it depends on the Rashomon ratio. And if the Rashomon ratio is large, then um, the probability is large. And what that means is that in that case, that's the case where the best simple model on the training set isn't too much worse than the best complicated model on the test set. And the bound is nice and tight. Now, the probability here is pretty inscrutable. So I'm gonna give you some examples. Okay, so the first example is if the complicated, you know, if the universe complicated model class has 100,000 functions in it, and the Rashomon ratio is 1%, so 1% of those models are good, then the bound holds with 99% probability as long as you have at least 526 models in the simpler class, right? So as long as 526 models are randomly drawn from this set to be in the simpler class, then as it turns out, you get the bound with 99% probability as long as at least 1% of the models are good. And here's another example. If the, um, if the more complex model class has 100, again, 100,000 functions, and even half a percent of them are good, then the bound holds with 99% probability as long as the simpler model class has 1,000 functions in it. And remember, the simpler functions, um, you know, the, these functions are drawn randomly from the set of complicated models, right? So you know, you're not looking at the Rashomon ratio when you decide what the simpler functions are. Okay, cool. So what, what it's saying is that large Rashomon sets allow you to say that what you are seeing on the training set is close to what you wish you could see on the test set.
Okay, so in other words, we'll say it again. If the Rashomon ratio is sufficiently large, if you have enough good models in existence, then with high probability, the best empirical risk over the simpler class is close to the best possible true risk over the larger class. And the generalization guarantee comes from F1, the smaller class, and the size of the Rashomon set over here. Okay, cool. And now, you, as I mentioned, this is not a very realistic setup because the simple functions are not randomly drawn um, from the more complex functions, right? That's not realistic. But there are very simple extensions of this theorem that can be used for more realistic function classes. Like you can replace the, this random draw assumption with a smoothness assumption. Or you could, um, like the smoothness assumption would say something like, well, every function in, in F2 is approximated by a function from F1. Like F1 is somewhat dense in the space of F2. Um, the other assumption is that the Rashomon set contains a large ball. And if the Rashomon set contains a large ball in, in some kind of continuous function space, then as long as you have, as long as F1 serves as a good enough cover for that space, um, then you get, you get a theorem that's very, very similar to this. Do you guys hear a lot of noise in the background? Should I switch rooms or are we okay? Because I'm hearing a lot of noise going on outside. Do you hear I that? Hear noise. What? I don't hear any noise actually. It seems fine to me. Okay, perfect. Then I'll just keep talking. It's from my end, what I hear is a tremendous amount of noise and it's all coming from outside my house and there's nothing I can do about it. I think it's like all the leaves have come down and then all the leaf people are blowing all the leaves everywhere. Okay. So in any case, um, so these results and the other theorems that I mentioned but didn't show, um, the ones about the smoothness and so on. So what they suggest is that as long as the simpler class is a good approximating set for F2, the more complex class, and the Rashomon set is large, then we might as well work with the simpler class because you're not getting any benefit from working with the more complex class. So for example, if decision trees approximate neural networks and for, and for my problem, the Rashomon set is large, then I can work with decision trees because I'm not getting any benefit from neural networks. So it's kind of like a way to prove that, you know, uh, under this condition that the Rashomon set is large, that you, that you can actually work with simple functions and actually not lose anything. So it's a, it's a technical argument as to why simple functions perform well. Okay, now we are not doing standard learning theory here. Standard learning theory bounds the difference of training and test accuracy for one model. The Rashomon ratio bound does not work the same way that standard learning theory works. It's not the same as standard complexity measures used in learning theory. And I wanna show you, um, given that some of you are familiar with these concepts, I wanna tell you why they're different. So large Rashomon ratios pertain to the existence of models with good generalization. They say whether something exists, okay? That's different than standard learning theory. The, Ra the Rashomon ratio is not the geometric margin that's used in support vector machines um, because the margin is measured with respect to one model, right? The margin is the distance between the point and the decision boundary. Whereas uh, the Rashomon ratio is measured with respect to many models. Um, it's not the same thing as the VC dimension the VC dimension is data independent. The Rashomon, set, Rashomon ratio is a property of a data set. It's not the same thing as algorithmic stability. Algorithmic stability is a property of an algorithm, um, whereas the Rashomon ratio is a property of a function class, and it's not a property of how you search through that function class. It's not the same thing as Rademacher complexity. Rademacher complexity measures the ability of a function class to fit noisy targets, whereas the Rashomon ratio uses fixed labels. And it's not the same thing as a flat minimum, um, which is often used to understand neural networks because the Rashomon ratio, or the Rashomon set itself could include many local minima, as I was showing you in the pictures earlier where I showed you Rashomon sets that were disjoint and even it works in discrete spaces where there's no, you know, where the whole space is discrete. So, so far, what I've shown you is that theory says that large Rashomon sets allow us to use simple functions without losing accuracy. So that's what the theory says. What about practice? What happens in practice? Now, 
normally you can't measure the Rashomon set because it requires you to look at the whole model class, which you can't do, it's impractical, but <laughs> we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> All right, so remember, um, I'm, I'm gonna define here just the empirical Rashomon ratio, which is this the fraction of functions that are good um, on our data set. So just take all functions here and take the fraction of them that have a low empirical risk. That's our empirical Rashomon ratio. And you would never, like I said, you'd never calculate this in reality because you actually, you actually have to enumerate over the whole function class, which you would never do. But um, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna do it anyway. And um, of course, you know, don't try this at home. But what we found was pretty interesting. And as we found out, you don't actually have to calculate the Rashomon ratio in reality to gain practical insights from it. Okay, so we did an experiment. Now, part A of this experiment is to calculate the size of the empirical Rashomon set using decision trees of depth seven. Why would we do that? Okay, so the reason is because decision trees can be sampled. And depth seven decision trees are a good approximating set for a very, very large function space because they're able to fit our data sets. You can fit a lot with a depth seven um, decision tree. Okay, and then, great. So part A will give us an estimate of the size of the Rashomon set, okay? So part A, measure the size of the Rashomon set. Part B, we're gonna construct, we're gonna think about a function class, big function class like this, that incorporates um, lots of different other function classes. So, so like decision trees and support vector machines and boosted decision trees and random forest. So I want you to think about that big function space. And then if I'm correct, right? If I'm correct that, um, that the Rashomon set is big, then we might expect to see that, um, sorry, this is my covering of the Rashomon set with decision trees of depth seven. So the green, the green dots are supposed to represent decision trees of depth seven. And then when I run all my different algorithms, um, I'm gonna just calculate, I'm just gonna check their performance, right? Do they all perform similarly? Do they all generalize? Because if they all perform similarly, what it means is that they are all in the Rashomon set, right? Boosting, boosted decision trees would give us a model that's, if it's at the same level of accuracy as a random forest, then they're both, you know, they're both in the Rashomon set. Um, support vector machines, right? If they all perform about the same, then I'm guessing that's about the best we can we can do. And um, and they're all in the same Rashomon set because they all have the same good performance. Okay, and then we're just gonna calculate, we're just gonna check whether these things agree with each other, right? Um, so see if A and B are correlated. Uh, is it true that um, that if you that if you um, have if, if you have a large Rashomon set, is that, is that, does that tell you that um, all the machine learning methods are gonna perform similarly? Like, what does that mean? And so I've, I've revealed my punchline right here, uh, which is that when the Rashomon set, when the Rashomon ratio is large, it turns out that all of the machine learning methods perform similarly, and they also generalize really well to the test set, okay? So these two things are correlated with each other, right? A large Rashomon ratio actually implies that machine learning methods have similar performance and that they generalize. So let me show you the results of, the, of this experiment here. Oh, interestingly, the result isn't always true. And I'll explain more about why that, that might be. And, it, and, and the answer is that it, I think it has to do with the way we're measuring the size of the Rashomon set. Okay, so, um, let me show you the results here. We have 64 data sets. Um, some of them are categorical data sets from the repository. Um, some are real value data sets. Some are regression. Some are synthetic classification data sets. So it's a, a, large, a, a large variation in the number of features and the number of classes. And here's what we found. OK, if there's a large Rashomon ratio, then for, I'm showing you four examples, right? These are four data sets here voting credit card and so on. And then these are different machine learning methods and then training is blue and testing is kind of light blue. And so what you're seeing here is that all of the different machine learning methods perform the same like logistic regression, cart, random forest, gradient boosted trees, support vector machines. They all perform the same and they all generalize nicely. Okay, so that's what happens when we have large Rashomon ratio. When we have small Rashomon ratio, we do not see the same thing. Um, we very often see uh, 
you know, the results are all over the place, different methods perform differently, and they don't generalize that well between training and test. I mean, like I said, sometimes we also see that even for small Rashomon ratios, everything performs really, really nicely. Um, so that, that actually happens too. But again, I think that has to do with the way that we're measuring um, the Rashomon set, the size of the Rashomon set. I think we're, we're sort of making it artificially small um, when in fact, for some of these data sets, actually the true Rashomon set is, is, um, is larger. Okay, so what that's saying is that, um, you know, we're getting a lot out of these experiments because, you know, we can't actually measure the Rashomon ratio in practice. But what it means is that, well, if, if, you, if you suspect your Rashomon ratio is large, well, let's see, you could check if all your machine learning methods are performing similarly to each other. And then in that case, the Rashomon ratio might be large, in which case you might be able to use simple models and not losing the accuracy. Okay, so yeah, if, if the Rashomon ratio is large, all the methods perform similarly and they all generalize well. And if the methods tend to perform differently, well, that's likely a small Rashomon ratio and you might not benefit from trying to use a very, very simple model. Okay, so there was something else that we noticed about this, um, the, result, the results that I just showed you. So what, what I'm gonna plot is something that we call the Rashomon curve. And we weren't expecting to see this, but we found it on every single data set that we worked with. And we weren't expecting to see it at all. And I'm gonna show you a cartoon of it before I show you the real ones. And it's a plot of the log of the Rashomon ratio versus the empirical risk. So this is actually the best empirical rich risk over each function class. So in other words, you take each function class and then you, you minimize the empirical risk over that function class and plot the empirical risk. Okay, so let's say that you take a hierarchy of spaces. So this is like decision trees of depth one, depth two, depth three, and so on. And all these classes are embedded in each other. And now what do you expect to happen? Let's see, um, well, if you go from decision trees of depth one to depth two to depth three, what do you expect to happen to the empirical risk? Right, you expect it to go down because you are increasing the level of complexity and so you can fit the data better. And so the, the loss goes down, you're able to fit, you can fit the data better. Okay, so as you increase complexity, the empirical risk goes down. What about the Rashomon ratio? Well, the Rashomon ratio, it looks like this. Again, it's the fraction of good models and as you add more models, well, there's more, mo there's more good models, but there's also more models, right? So both the numerator and the denominator grow. And as it turns out, um, the denominator grows much faster than the numerator. And I didn't, you know, I didn't know this, right? We didn't know this um, when we did this. So as it turns out, um, it goes down. So what you're gonna expect to see when I start plotting the points on this plot is that it's gonna go down. Okay, so I'll start with decision trees of depth one. Um, the empirical risk is not very good. Uh, sorry, the empirical risk is, it's not very good because you're all the way out here. Um, you have decision trees of depth one <laughs> and the, the Rashomon ratio is actually really large. And then as you increase the decision trees of depth two, your empirical risk is better and your Rashomon ratio stays about the same, to be honest. And then you get to three and then all of a sudden at some point it just takes a nosedive and just goes and, um, you know, like, like I said, it, it's, it's just crazy. Like the Rashomon ratio, it gets really, really tiny as these function spaces get bigger and bigger. And you might see a little bit of overfitting here. Like you might see it go to the left a little bit, but uh, it knows dives so quickly that you don't even see it. And um, there's always some kind of elbow, like some kind of turning point. And you might not see the whole curve, right? You might just see part of it. So, like you might only see like the vertical part if you haven't made, if you know, if already a, a decision tree of depth one does really well on that data set, you might just see the vertical part, right? Now, as I mentioned, we see this on every data set that we've experimented with and it always looks like this. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you some examples. Um, these are, this is just some of the data sets and it looks sort of like, you know, like textbook examples of this illustration. Um, and then here is some of the other data sets, MNIST and credit card and so on. 
um, it's really quite remarkable what, what, you, what you end up seeing with us. Um, so that's what happens with the training set. So let me tell you about the test set. So with the test set, what we expect to see is we can, you know, we combine the Rashomon curve with regular learning theory, like standard learning theory. And what you expect to see is that you generalize better for the simpler function classes, and then you overfit for the more complex classes. So what you'd expect to see is that this, this you know, you go from training to test, you just get worse test performance. Um, uh, like the, the difference between training and test is larger for um, when you overfit more for the more complex model classes. Okay, so the best rate, the best test error rate over here is right at the elbow. That's the best test error right here in this illustration. And so we call that, we call that the Rashomon elbow. All right, so let me show you some results here again on our 64 data sets. And I'm going to show you the Rashomon curves for all 64 data sets. And as you can see, we see a full blown Rashomon curve in every single data set. And we're averaging over 10 folds to plot these Rashomon curves for both uh, for training and test empirical risks, as well as the Rashomon ratios. And so, you know, what you would see here is a Rashomon curve, either one that goes, you know, across and down or just down um, for all the data sets. And then the second thing you want to look at is the generalization between training and test. So I'm going to zoom into some of these curves so you can see what's going on. Um, so here's, here's one of these curves. Um, some of the curves, two of the curves here. And these curves agree exactly with learning theory. So here the best, uh, the best point is right at the elbow. Um, the best tester is right at the elbow. It generalizes nicely. You get this nice curve. That's great. And then um, sometimes, as it turns out, uh, you know, data is kind of funky. Sometimes you just always generalize. And so the difference between training and test is like zero. And then sometimes you never generalize. Uh, the training and test sets were just different. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's what you get. But in any case, regardless of which one it is, your best bet is to be at the elbow because the, the elbow tends to be like the simplest model class for which you can um, assume that you can generalize. All right, so, but the thing is that in real problems, you don't always end up having the whole curve and you don't even know what part of the curve you're on. Um, so you might want to figure out where you are on that Rashomon curve in order to determine whether, you know, where you are in relation to that elbow, right? Uh, and remember, you can't measure any point on the curve because in order to measure where you are on this curve, you need the Rashomon ratio and you never have that. Okay, yeah, so the elbow model always seems to be a good choice for, for model selection. You want to choose the simplest model class for which you get that good performance. Um, like the same as the, uh, the more complex model classes. Okay, so then th that brings me to the question of answering, you know, well, where are you on this curve? Are you on, on this part of the curve? Well, um, in, if you're in that part, then what it means is that the best model for each of the different complexity classes has different performance. So for machine learning, if you have different algorithms that have different levels of performance, uh, that also have different levels of complexity, well, you know, that might mean you're on this part of the curve, right? Whereas if you are um, on this part of the curve, then no matter what complexity level you choose, like within reason, the empirical risk is always the same, right? All the, all the models are performing, all the, all the algorithms are going to perform similarly. And so in this case, your models are like down here, they're actually overly complex. And you could potentially reduce complexity to find models that are simpler or, or and, and generalize better. Okay, so I've been thinking that this kind, like this picture, might actually explain some of the things that me and others, maybe maybe like what Rob has been observing, um, you know, across problems and across data. Um, so there are some problems like ImageNet where the field has been designing more and more complicated models, and it reduces error. So maybe we're still like on this part of the curve and then adding more complexity actually might help. But on the other hand, um, if you consider problems like MNIST, then no matter which method you use, um, you get 100% accuracy. And so in that case, maybe we should be aiming for simpler models that, um, that might have other properties like interpretability and that might generalize better outside of MNIST, okay? And then there's a ton of problems of the kind I usually work on, um, these kinds of problems where it doesn't really matter which machine learning algorithm you pick. They all kind of perform the same, 
like for the rearrest data from Florida that I showed you. Um, like, and you, you just can't get a particularly accurate result no matter what you do. Like you'll just overfit if you make the models more complex. And for these types of problems, we want to lower complexity to walk upward toward that elbow. Okay, and then what I've gotten to is a simple check that doesn't involve computing Rashomon ratios <laughs> that can give you some general advice. And the advice is to pick several of your favorite machine learning methods and run them all on the data. And if they all perform differently, then maybe your model class is too small to include the elbow solution. And so you should maybe think about broadening your horizon by using more complex model class. And then on the other hand, if all the machine learning methods perform similarly, then um, your model class might actually be larger than necessary. And you want to, um, you know, they're all performing the same here and your model class might be more, more complex than, than it needs to be. So what you might wanna do is find some specialized models with some specific properties that you want, such as interpretability, or, or, or at least what you could do is improve your generalization by reducing, um, you know, by, by keep, you keep, keep your accuracy. So without reducing accuracy, just move upward toward the elbow by decreasing complexity. Okay, so I finished the first part of the talk, which is, you know, the, the bulk of the talk, which is to, you know, define a condition under which a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist. And um, if you want to hear, see more details about that and, and the experiments, um, you can check out our paper, which is on archive. And then what I thought I would do for the rest of the talk is um, discuss some discuss decision trees, right? Some computationally efficient solutions to some of these hard um, optimization problems. But before I do that, I'm gonna do like a quick interlude and just tell you a little bit about an experience I had. Um, I was participating in this challenge. This was a challenge where the data was given to us from FICO and our job was to create a black box and explain it. And our team looked at this data set and we were like, I don't know about this. I don't think we need to create a black box and explain it. Maybe we can get away with an interpretable model. And so I had my students go off and run a whole bunch of different machine learning algorithms on the data set. And they were like, nope, they're all performing the same. And then we knew immediately that we could create an interpretable model that was just gonna be just as accurate as the best of our black boxes. And that turned out to be true. And so we sent this uh, into the challenge, but we designed, we, we took a risky strategy and designed, designed a really cool visualization tool for our model. That was, you know, it was really great and fun to play with and stuff, but the judges had no clue what to do with the visualization tool. And so they just completely disregarded our model. It, it was a really neat tool. It brought, you know, you click on stuff and you get little sub scores and so on. It was really neat. And so the judges um, just threw our model. We didn't, we didn't even place in the competition, even though we didn't even use a black box. Um, so, but we, we questioned the judges about it and then they realized that their judging criteria wasn't particularly good. And so they gave us this, um, they created an award for us. They said, we're, you know, we're going to give you this FICO recognition award, acknowledging your submission for going above and beyond expectations with a fully transparent global model and a user-friendly dashboard to allow users to explore the global model and its explanations. And so I was really excited about this and I thought, okay, let's, let's write a paper and send it to a special issue of a journal. And so I was told to go talk to the editor of the special issue to find out whether the paper was suitable. So I did. I wrote, um, dear, you know, um, prestigious professor at prestigious, fancy esteemed professor at prestigious university. Uh, I wrote, well, we have this paper. We don't know whether the paper fits into the scope of the special issue. It's not a traditional methodology paper. It's, it's an a contribution is analysis of this data including um, you know, an interpretable machine learning method. You don't need a black box for this data set. And it won this award. So he emails me back and he says, Cynthia, thanks for reaching out. This is an interesting paper, but it's not a good fit for the special issue. It's also related to my own recent work on explainability of neural nets. Is that data set still available? If so, could you share it? And I was like, oh my gosh, like here, I just told the guy, you don't need a neural network for this data set. And here he wanted the data set so he could take, take the data set, throw a neural network at it and explain what the neural network is doing. It's just absolutely ridiculous. But unfortunately, that's the state of where things are right now in machine learning. Anyway, <laughs> so that kind of gets you 
maybe hopefully to understand why I still care about things like decision trees, because decision trees are still relevant. Okay, and so these are some of the topics I work on in my lab. Um, I work on decision trees, I work on scoring systems for medical applications. Um, I work on matching for causal inference, as Russ knows very well. <laughs> um, and I'm working on interpretable deep neural networks for computer vision, where you have to define what interpretability means kind of carefully. But so let me tell you about um, decision trees. So this is work with Margo Seltzer uh, at the University of British Columbia and, and a whole bunch of our wonderful students. And um, the thing about decision tree uh, optimization, uh, they, decision trees have been popular since the very beginning of machine learning. And the main problem that's always plagued decision tree algorithms is their lack of optimality because they've historically been greedy myopic algorithms like CART and C4.5. And these algorithms, they construct trees from the top downward and then they greedily prune them back afterward. And the problem is that if the decision tree algorithm chooses the wrong split at the top, then there's really no way to undo it. You're, you're actually kind of stuck. Um, but the problem is that um, there's just so many different ways, like there's, it's hard to improve over the greedy algorithms because there's so many different arrangements of variables and splits and so on. It's a, a combinatorial explosion and the number of possible trees you could consider. And people have you know, tried modern approaches like mathematical programming solvers. They're slow because they're generic um, mathematical programming solvers. People have even tried using neural networks to construct decision trees. Neural networks have no guarantees of optimality and they don't, this is not, not a, they don't work well for discrete optimization problems. It's not a good idea. So um, what we've been trying to do is uh, provide the first really practical algorithms for um, optimal sparse binary split decision trees. And we've been trying to minimize things like, you know, misclassification error, um, uh, you know, with a regularization that is a sparsity regularization is the number of leaves in the tree. And then when we solve this problem to optimality, right, minimize this loss over all trees, um, the solutions to these optimization problems uh, look like trees. Uh, there, there's no greedy splitting and pruning like in C4.5 and CART, it's just not that kind of algorithm. And uh, the key to it is um, very accurate branch and bound um, combined with um, computing systems. And here's, here's just an example of an, an, an optimal tree on that Florida Back to that Florida rearrest data that I talked about at the beginning. So this is just an example of what comes out of minimizing this uh, objective. Okay, um, so the, I'm going to tell you about some of the key tools that we've developed um, to for solving this problem. And the first is a collection of theorems. It's a bunch of analytical bounds that reduce the size of the search space. And these bounds allow us to prove that some partial trees can never be extended to form optimal full trees. Um, the bounds tell us that, that, you know, that, cert that certain partial trees just are bad, that they'll never lead to an optimal full tree. You can never extend them to form an optimal full tree. So for instance, if I'm thinking about predicting whether I'm gonna get stuck in tra a traffic jam on my way home, uh, if I ever drive anywhere ever again, um, then you know I might consider whether there's a tornado. Um, but the thing is, you know, there's just, tornado doesn't happen that often, and so there might not be enough data to warrant an extra split on tornado. And so in that case, if there's not enough data, I would never make that split, and I would never like I can eliminate that tree and everything below it. Right? There's no way I'd ever extend that tree to form an optimal full tree. I'm better off removing that particular um, that particular decision node. Okay, there's also the theorems that say that if you don't have, um, if, the, if when you make a split, you wouldn't get an accurate enough tree, then you would never make that split. And again, you can prove that you're not sacrificing optimality to get rid of that, that whole, that partial tree. Uh, you can also prove um, bounds on the size of an optimal solution to that decision tree problem as well, based on how good your current best solution is relative to the number of trees that you, leaves that you already have in the tree. Um, other things we do are, um, we have really nice representations for these trees in the database. Um, the way I've written it here, that is not the way we represent tree in the, a tree in the computer. We represent each tree by its collection of leaves. 
So here, the first leaf is rain, construction, and traffic. And the second leaf is rain, construction, and no traffic. Uh, sorry, rain, no construction, and no traffic. Sorry about that. And then here's the third leaf, which is no rain. Yes, rush hour. Yes, construction and traffic and so on. And so we, we actually represent, like I said, we represent the tree just by the leaves. And if you have the leaves, you can reconstruct the tree. That's not a problem. Okay, and then another thing, we, another reason why this representation is useful, uh, because you can always look at um, isomorphisms of, you, you can, you can, if you find an isomorphism of a tree that you've seen before, all you have to do is look through the collection of leaves that you've seen before and then you know, oh, you wait, I, you know, I've seen that one before. So in other words, if you're, um, if you're progressing through the search over all trees and you find a collection of leaves that you've seen together previously, then you can throw it out because you've already dealt with it. And um, we have a special data structure that keeps track of collections of leaves that, you know, trees that we've seen before. Um, yeah, so if we see this collection of leaves again, we will know that we've handled it before and we're done. Another thing we do is describe the data set uh, by, um, well, we describe each leaf by its a bit vector that lists where, where each, which leaf each data point fits into. So here, the first data point in the data set fits into the first leaf, um, which is this one, rain, construction, and traffic. And then the second and third data points in the data set um, fall into the second leaf and, um, and so on. So by writing, by writing everything this way, then we're actually dealing with bit vector operations, which are very, very fast to deal with in, in the computer. So it perm permits very fast bit vector operations to compute all of our theoretical bounds to help reduce the size of the search space without sacrificing optimality. And then we also um, do incremental computation. So incremental computation is where you use your computation that you've done previously to help out with the later computation. So for instance, if I've already calculated my lower bound on the optimal decision tree um, here, and then I have my the vector of which data points fall into this leaf, then I can use that to help calculate um, the things that are below it. Like I can use it to help calculate the bound for, you know, if I'm thinking about building on this, on this leaf right here. Yeah. Okay, so this combination of the theorems, the leaf-based representation, the permutation map, the caching of intermediate results and incremental computation just makes the whole calculation very, very fast. And um, what we have right now in our current work is that we, we not only can handle classification loss, we can do any loss function that's increasing in false positives and false negatives. We can do um, area under the curve, um, partial area under the curve. So it's actually very, very general. And then we've, um, we've gone to a dynamic, dynamic programming framework, which reduces the number of repeated subproblems, and it makes it, again, um, very, very efficient. Okay, and yeah, you can, you can check out the paper if you want. Um, so just to summarize, I've defined a condition under which a simple yet accurate model is likely to exist, which is that the Rashomon set is large. And I showed a simple check for large Rashomon sets, which is that you can try a whole bunch of different machine learning methods. And if they all perform the same, it's possible that you have a large Rashomon set, in which case you can go ahead and try to find a simple model that's just as accurate as your, or, um, as your models from any other machine learning method. I also introduced Rashomon curves, which is this kind of characteristic curve that happens to be present for all of the 64 data sets we've looked at. And then finally, I ended with um, talking about computationally efficient solutions to some of the hard op optimization problems that uh, show up in interpretable machine learning when you try to add constraints to make your model um, more interpretable. Yeah, and that's um, optimal sparse decision trees. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, Cynthia, I want to get in first for a question or two because I have to head to another meeting. Um, but they're brief, and unlike what people expect from Randy, the questions are brief, informed by our discussions earlier today. The first one is, um, we, we both acknowledge that the world changes and that the data sets uh, should change for the application of learning to be able to continually update. How stable are the Rashomon, um, is the Rashomon set, and, and do you have some 
potential measure of where to look to um, try to encourage stability so that you always understand how change in the data creates um, minimal perturbation there. The other one is about dependence and independence that we talked about. When you talked about better or worse models, there should be differentials there that help us throw away features, variables, or attributes that simply are irrelevant, right? So you just totally read my mind, by the way, with the, with the, um, the first question you asked, because yeah. that's exactly what we're working on. Um, we're Yay! actually working on robustness, and we have a we have a yep. kind of a partial follow up paper to the Rashomon sets paper on exactly the question that you're talking about. But I don't have any firm answers for you yet. We're still just kind of trying to even formulate what what the no, whole thing but means. But formulating how you can measure that volatility is is insight into differentiating models. So that's great. Yeah, we're trying to we're trying to see what will happen if the domain changes. Like if the underlying domain changes a bit, um, will a large yep. Rashomon set kind of yep. give you more robustness. Yeah, that's exactly what we're working on. And that's not yeah. independent from the question of dependence and independence we talked about, because what you want to be able to do is to say to um, the subject domain experts is that, you know, what you thought of as relevant variables turn out not to be so important in making accurate predictions, right? Yeah, so we actually have, there, there's a paper that we wrote um, that I think you've seen, um, yes. which, which uh, looks at, the range of variable importance for the set of all models in the Rashomon set. Yes. And okay. so what, what it does is it tells you, hey, um, you know, no matter which, as long as you choose a reasonably good model, it doesn't depend on that variable. Yep. And so you can throw that variable out. Yep. And so that's, and that's exactly what we're, and, and to be honest, we're actually doing that for the decision tree project too. We're actually, okay. um, we found a way to, to sort of do that type of calculation to help us reduce the, the size of these decision tree problems by getting yeah, rid of and it the informs the intuition out. people have about decision trees to say, oh, now I know why that's not important. That's great. My colleague, Nilanjan Ray, will be happy to note that, that you can analytically um, identify those variables which have less impact because when he's trimming his models down from billions to millions of variables, at least there's some guidance. So thanks very much. Well, I'll send Thank you the COVID papers as promised. Yeah, it was lovely talking to you. I have a question about Rashman uh, complexity. So does the current analysis allow comparing data sets with different sizes? Because if you have a smaller data set, I think you'd have more of an under constraint problem and then more models would work well. So, you, so I guess that would imply that you would get better generalization on smaller data sets. So you're asking whether there's a pattern of the size of the Rashomon ratio, depending on the size of the data set. And we have, we looked at that and we did not find it. We were not able to find any clear pattern on that at all. The only thing that was really kind of useful was that um, uh, if you have a very, um, oh gosh, I don't remember the, I don't remember the answer to this. If, you're, if your model is already really, really accurate, then um, the size of the Rashomon set is really large. <laughs> so, but yeah, we didn't we didn't find any pattern with the with the number of data points or the number of features. We tried plotting everything under the sun, but we could have missed something. I mean, so, if you find it, <laughs> I mean, it's probably something wrong actually. Not that like, not that you have to find it because. So the implication was that if the if like a large if a larger ratio of uh, models in the in the class worked better, then you would get better generalization, I think. And then a result of the, like the consequence of that would be that if your data set is smaller, then you would get better generalization, I think. Like because if the data set is smaller, that your training data set is smaller, then you have more of an under constraint problem. No, but then your bounds depend on one over the number of data points. And so the bound gets worse anyway. Okay, so like the bound already controls it because my point is that if the, if the data set is smaller, then you would have less of a, less constraints on your, on your like, on your, on your problem. So a larger ratio of models in your class would work well and achieve low empirical risk. So it's about it's the if you look at that um, if you look at the right hand side of that bound it has the Rashomon ratio or the Rashomon ratio is buried in the probability, and then you have also the number of data points and you have the size of the um, function class and so all of these three three things interact with each other. Okay, so like I mean, 
So I guess if the density is smaller than the ratio, then the ratio, uh, the Rashomon ratio would actually be uh, better in terms of generalization, but the dependence on the number of data points would cancel that out. Yeah. Because like the ratio itself depends on the size of the data. Yeah, that's right. Yep, you got it. So thinking about the, some of the assumptions, like the uniformity assumptions, if, if you're considering, for example, linear functions and the truth involves exclusive or, it just cannot represent it. Does that, does that come out from your assumption about the simple models being so universe, uniformly spread around or is there a way to? Or yeah, so, it, so that's a case hmm. where that's a case where the Rashomon ratio would be, would like if, if there's a very specific formula that you need to get in order to get high accuracy, um, that's a case where the Rashomon ratio would be really tiny. Maybe this class thing just can't express it, so. Yeah, so you have, so the, remember the formula has F2 and F1. Yes. Right, but there might be many different sparse, many, very, many different sparse sets, one of which includes uh, linear functions. And I might be other functions, but they're not uniformly spread. I'm trying to think of, of where yeah. the So certainly there are certain exceptions where if you if you have just universal approximators that can breathe things like it might work, if they're not universal approximators, if there's classes that are excluded, and if the real world, the particular problem inherently involves those, then it wouldn't have this uniformity thing that you're sort of, you're drawing uniformity from the sets and you're You're exactly right. So F1 has to be able to approximate F2. Yeah, okay. And yeah. that's something that we we wrote several different, we have three three different theorems um, on exactly what that means. But yes, you can't, if, if F1 doesn't approximate F2, none of the theorems hold. Okay, that, that was the gap, okay, good. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Great talk, by the way, this is fascinating. Thank you. It's, it's amazing to hear that from, from you. <laughs> so. Any other questions? Okay, if there's no other questions, then uh, um, I want to thank you for a wonderful talk. And I can see in the chat that there's more people thanking you for a wonderful talk. So thank you very much uh, for joining us, Cynthia. And, uh, you know, who knows? Hopefully we'll have you back in a year or two to give us an update. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of a bunch of people there, as you know, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you have a good weekend. You too. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.